We are going to have a conversation up here about no. what it takes to get reparations policy passed at the state and local levels. Um, we we wanted to get started and then we, we, we lost the mayor. So we're hoping that he will come back and join us on this panel. Um, but we're going to get started because we still have a lot to do uh, and to talk about today. So. We're gonna start by um, just, I'm gonna have my panelists introduce themselves. So I'll pass it to Assemblywoman Sumter. Thank you, thank you so much for having me this afternoon. I'm Assemblywoman Shavonda Sumter. I represent the 35th District, which includes both Passaic and Bergen County, Patterson proper. I've been in office since 2012. I serve as chair of the New Jersey Legislative Black Caucus, and I'm excited to be here because the energy is really recharging my battery from a long Black History Month. <laughs> and, and I'm excited about the thought leadership uh, that I have heard uh, as I came in and I see on your bulletin board. Thank you. There he is. Give him a round of applause. Yeah, you do, brother. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Mayor Baraka, would you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Mayor Baraka, Newark, New Jersey. <laughs> uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm late because Ryan put me out. <laughs> I told him to come back at one. So. But at, at, the, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm excited about talking about this topic right here. Uh, it's incredibly important. I went to the budget address yesterday, uh, the state budget address, and. You know, what's interesting to me, how I look at all of that is, you know, people usually say, you know, black and brown people and talk about us in a way that it's a deficit, that there is a gap. Uh, but nobody talks about directly addressing that gap. We, we talk about things in a very innocuous way. And we say, oh, we're going to put money in housing. We're going to put more money uh, for doulas or health care. We're going to put more money in these places where they know disproportionately uh, we are affected by, but that no one says directly the causes of this gap mm. and how those causes should be addressed directly and not indirectly. <coughs> and what people should understand is before most of us became Democrats, I'm a, somebody asked me why you're a Democrat, uh, and I said I'm a Democrat because my mama was a Democrat and her mama was a Democrat and they mama became Democrats because of FDR yeah. uh, and because, mm. you know, people began to move from, from the Republican Party because they focused more on economics than on, on social justice and making sure that we had civil rights and equality and, and dealing with the things that are very specific. And we should be careful that we don't go in that way and begin to make everything uh, you know, without identity. Right? Because we don't, we're so caught up in this, I don't want to be involved in identity politics. But the only people that don't like identity politics or folks who don't never had their identity in question. Right. Right. So it's important for us to engage it very specifically. So I'm happy to be here today. Thank you, so thank you for letting me come here late and all. Appreciate it. All right, Ryan, tell us who you are. Yeah, I, I do apologize. I did give the mayor bad information. I said one. I tried to amend it through a series of texts that he did not see. Uh, so I apologize. But my name is Ryan Hagan. I just want to tell you how gratifying it is to be in this room, for those of you not from the city, we welcome you with open arms to the mighty, mighty city of New Ark, New Jerusalem. Uh, I lead with an amazing team of folks at the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice. This is our 25th anniversary year. And so yeah, yeah. I can't think of a better uh, way to spend some of that time than having this forward-thinking conversation about what it means to the mayor's point for black people uh, to finally win, which I think is what the root of reparations is about. Right. So I, I want to frame this whole conversation really about what does it look like for us to have a strategic and effective inside-outside game? And the fact that you know we all have our roles to play and we can be helping each other if we are connected and we are thinking strategically and future focused around what's gonna be. So I wanna, I wanna actually start with Assemblywoman Sumter to basically help us understand how we got here. Tell us about the bill that you introduced. Let's start there. Great, thank you for that question. And 
Uh, it's been a long journey. Uh, so I've been in office since 2012. We fought some tough battles together. 2019, this concept idea of a bill was introduced uh, and the wind was at our back. Like literally uh, when uh, Ryan and I were talking, I remember saying clearly, no problem. Why? It was a democratic controlled legislature. It was a democratic controlled Senate assembly and we had a governor that were Democrats. Mm -hmm. The campaign was restorative justice, disparity this, black folks need this, black folks need that. And this was an opportunity to create solely a task force, right. mm -hmm. a task force mm -hmm. to study the issue. Mm -hmm. We have task force for, you name it, we got it. Task force to study the problems with transit task force to study uh, the issue with school and over enforcement and policing, task force to study the housing needs, and task force to study the wealth gaps. And I received pushback and I was lured. I was like, wait a minute, we just campaigned and ran around the state and said, you cared about these issues. And this was a way, this legislation to get at very prescriptive decision making and not the hodgepodge, I'm gonna give you money for this, I'm gonna give you money for a health disparity, I'm gonna give you some money for a school problem for mental health. This was a way to have thought leaders across the state come together, put pen to paper to define it. Excited, California picked up the bill, go New Jersey. Right? And typically New Jersey as a progressive state and California would go back and forth on the legislation that we would put forth. Because of the type of leader that I am, I went to the speaker at the time and said, I don't understand the challenge here. We said we care about these things. This is a remedy. We have task force all the time. First, it was, well, why don't we put it in higher education? I said, I don't want to put it in higher education because it doesn't belong to one institution. Mm -hmm. This is a state body of knowledge for the over 9 million people that have suffered harm at the hands of enslavement. Well, why don't we call it anything else but reparations <laughs> and we can get it through. So I had to lean back in a chair and, and I did one of those. Because you, you have to at least give it some consideration. And I said, let me give it some consideration. I, I, I don't feel comfortable making that determination without talking to my constituency and my partners who are working with me on this issue. Because it's one thing to negotiate, but what I have learned, being in a decision-making position that can change policy, is that I never want to negotiate black people out. And this was one of those moments where I came back to my constituency group and I said, listen, I can get it done. We can call it anything but reparations. What's your sentiment? It was a hard no. So hence, my good brother over here and my good brother over here stood with me in holding the line where we were not going to compromise on the word and the term reparations. If any of you were with us during that period, Rebananya, I know you were there. League of Women Voters, you were there. Brandon, you were there. We got a wealth disparities task force <laughs> with the same composition of the reparations task force. Any of you see that report yet? <laughs> Say it loud. Any of you see that report yet? No. no. I'm still waiting for that report, too. So not willing to compromise landed us here with another term of reintroduction, and the bill is 602 on the assembly side. A senator will introduce it on the Senate side this coming week. If not, I'm going to find another senator. Different conversation. But what I must emphasize is 
that Senator Rice had the bill on the Senate side. I need a strong advocate, strong voice to push the limits. This is one of those we don't want to compromise because of the integrity of the bill. California took the bill, passed the bill, did the work, came up with some restorative action and reparations. New York's executive took the bill, came up with an executive decision to set up her own task force based on our work. And we're still having a conversation where we're in the majority in all spaces. Senator Rice has transitioned to glory. <laughs> And we still have not even had a hearing on this bill. In a legislative process, my frustration, I'm sorry, just one more frustration, is that the process is to have a hearing to hear the good, the bad, the ugly, what's needed to go in it to make it a better bill. And that's what the fight is today, and that's why I'm happy to be here to have the discussion. I, you know, I want to probe on this question because Let's get underneath it. What do you think are the challenges? What, what's holding folks back? And what would change this current situation? So we've done a great job. Municipalities have picked up this as a resolution to say that they are in favor of it. And we have over 500 municipalities, which you've heard and you have talked through. So we need that process to recalibrate again. you got to have courage. This is one of those bills where you have to bite the bullet. I'm told at times, oh, it doesn't survey well when you say the word reparations. Mm -hmm. Right. Who are you surveying? <laughs> right? That's the first question we, we must always ask these days. Right? What's that universe look like? Um, and how do we flood? district offices and leader offices to compel them to take an action. And we get so distracted, not that any issue is less important, by the barrage of issues that keep facing us. They're all important, but this is the one place where it all will be documented for us to really work on prescriptive repair and not one-offs, as you heard the mayor allude to you know, when hearing a budget address. This needs to be a comprehensive approach that is probably a multi-year, multi-generation approach into those most harmed are dying because of age and time. So we'd like this to happen in their lifetime. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put something you said in the parking lot, which is surveying, because that's something that people outside can be doing in order to put more pressure on folks inside. So I wanna take it to you, Mayor Baraka. What do you see as the role of cities in this work? Thank you. First, I uh, just want to thank the Assembly for all the work she's been doing around this. It's been uh, incredible. But as was stated earlier, first, you know, we need to get our municipal councils to support a resolution saying we support the legislation on a state level, which has happened. And we may have to double down on that, right? You need uh, mayors across this, the state to begin to come out and speak about it and say this is what we need to come down and speak before the Assembly. Uh, to let folks know this is something that we support uh, and, and be a part of conversations like this one to help educate people in the community about the issues, talk about uh, why this is important. Uh, and this should not just be a conversation that we're having in black communities. Right? This is a conversation that should be, we, we, should be, we should be having this around the state in different places. That's important for us. A lot of times we have our social justice conversations in places where it's comfortable to have social justice conversations. And we come to these communities and do that, right? So people always protest in my community, right? But there's very, very seldom protest in other people's communities where it probably needs to be at. Because, you know, we need people to be educated on these specific topics, on these issues, so people can become aware. So those things need to happen, and it's mayor's jobs to communicate with each other. We talk about it all the time, urban mayors, different things like that. Why these things are important and how they benefit our populations uh, and, and, and a wider conversation about how it benefits the entire state of New Jersey. I think that conversation needs to be had as well. Absolutely. I want to ask you both a question before we move to Ryan, which is about the role of advocates outside. There are people in this room from so many different kinds of institutions, from nonprofits, advocacy organizations, universities, et cetera, funders, what are the thing, What do you want us to do to make your jobs easier? Say the word. 
Uh, but on a serious note, uh, the, the job of the advocates are to agitate. Your help has restored the right to vote to persons on probation and parole. In one of our uh, Faith Alliance meetings on the bill, uh, it was brought to my attention that guess what? We made that repair. We still have to include those incarcerated, but that was one of the things we were looking to repair. Access to home ownership. Right. We're making that repair because of some of the work the mayor did in home ownership in Newark for people who live in Newark to get out of apartments. HMFA <coughs> through the late Lieutenant Governor Sheila Oliver is using some of the Section 8 vouchers for people to purchase homes. 28% of those vouchers for home ownership went to black people. 26%, 23% went to Latino people. So it works systemically and structurally when we're intentional in our efforts. So we really need you to not grow tired in this work because it seems daunting. 2019, we're still working on it. We didn't get body cameras paid for when we first came out with it. Literally, and that was over 10 years ago, Shirley Turner, Senator, was the original sponsor of that. After the George Floyd incident, we had local police and PBA saying, yep, we'll take those body cameras now. Yes, 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 versus all the different towns and levels saying, we didn't want it, we can't afford it, things of that nature. So it works. It may not happen in the moment of now, or the urgency of now, but we have to keep doubling down in that space. It works. I would just agree with confirm everything that the Senator said. I mean, uh, a lot of folks in this in, in this room can be, become a testing ground, a proving ground for a lot of the work that needs to be done. And we, we begin to do that work here to prove that this is not only this is something that should happen, uh, that is obviously beneficial to families uh, across the state of New Jersey and how it benefits New Jersey's growth and development at the same time. These are conversations that can be had in a different way. I think you guys can pose those conversations in a different way, pose those questions in a different way, begin to fund specific uh, opportunities uh, for us to make this happen in a larger scale, right? To do small kind of, uh, you know, testing, uh, you know, all, all kinds of pilot programs. And th those are things that need to happen in discussions and after those pilot programs, you know, and, and your own surveys uh, yourself about, and, and not trust the fact that somebody else did a survey. Do your own focus groups and begin talking about this stuff and push polls on, on your own uh, uh, and begin to get this stuff uh, on the legislators' tables, on the governor's tables, so they can have the discussion. My political science professor, Ron Walters, says, at Howard University used to say, uh, if, you don't, if you're not in the conversation, then what you're saying doesn't matter, right? And that stuff would be, since I was a sophomore in college, like, we're out here saying all this stuff, but who's listening to me? Right, and if what I'm talking about is not being talked about in there, then you might as well not even say it, right? So how do we get what we're talking about out here to be the discussion in there, right? Which, which made me see as a kid then that I need to find a way to get inside of there. That way, the, the, what I'm talking about out here, I'm, I'm gonna be sure it's talked about in there because I'm gonna be in there, yeah. right? So that's, that's exactly what I think that this body can do. I'm hearing, I'm hearing organizing, I'm hearing research, I'm hearing really making the case, and not just in our own echo chambers, but outside of our echo chambers. Uh, so that's a lot of the work that NJISJ has been doing. Um, so I want to kick it to you, Ryan, and ask you to tell us a story about the New Jersey Reparations Council. How did it come about? Yeah, well, thanks, man. Um, so just so, I mean, just sitting here, so gratifying to be having this conversation in Newark with so many, I say, in catchy Taif in the back, just so many legendary national figures who've been leading this work for many, many years. Um, and to answer Arya's question, I just want to say really quickly, I see Justin Hansford in the room. Um, and in 2006, I was an attorney at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund that was founded by uh, the first, and until recently, only black Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall, more recently Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson. Think about that for a minute. Um, and uh, some of y'all still miss that. It took a minute. It took a minute. And I, it, it, it took a minute. It's like, come on, y'all. I know it's after lunch. It's like, come on, y'all. We're talking about reparations here. Um, 
And Justin was an intern. I was an attorney. And he and I were working then, 2006, on this effort to reauthorize a core provision of the Voting Rights Act. We're going to celebrate its 59th anniversary in a few weeks. This core provision required states with a long history of discrimination in voting to essentially seek federal approval before they did anything in voting. And so the sequence is 2006, we build this record, 15,000 pages, Congress reauthorizes the Voting Rights Act. Then President Bush signed it like eight days later. Congress passed it like 98 to zero in the Senate. On the assembly side, it was like 390 to 33. The, I remember these numbers as crazy all these years later. Uh, this is important because then, remember it was George Bush, and then in 2008, in part because of the, this piece of the Voting Rights Act, America elects its first black president. You all remember this, 08, right? right? And you remember there were some, not you all, far less sophisticated people outside of this room <laughs> talked about how his election ushered us into a post-racial America. You remember that? Right, right, yeah. right. And then President Obama wins a second term. Right, right. And then the Supreme Court strikes that piece of the Voting Rights Act I told you we work on reauthorizing in 2006. And then there's another election in 2016. Some would argue you can't have a 2008 and 2012 without then having a 2016, for those who understand the contested nature of democracy. So Ryan, why are you taking us through this historical sort of trot? The answer is because even then, we were kind of playing defense, right? We were defending against the loss of a thing, right. a core provision of the Voting Rights Act. And I think that too often when we talk about black people in this country, in our towns, in our states. If we get honest, it's largely a harm reduction strategy. Right. Yeah. Think about it, there was COVID. That was the leading cause of death of black people in 2020, New Jersey, George Floyd et al. Yeah. So much of those conversations began and ended with, how do we just stop the harm? Right. And for black people and folks who love black people, it's so exhausting for the black experience to be summed up in a harm reduction strategy. So all that context matters because this is pre-COVID, pre-George Floyd, we began having conversations about how might we build on a very long effort in state of New Jersey to have a conversation about how black people might actually win, right? Beyond harm reduction, certainly harm reduction should be part of our strategy, but what might it look like for us to create a New Jersey in which we win, which led us to create a conversation formally we wanted around reparations. And I'm gonna just say really quickly, this is 2019, we had Nicole Hannah-Jones come speak at NJ Pack. folks were there. It was sold out, she got like two standing ovations. This is when she just released the 1619 Project and the Times, it wasn't yet a book. This is pre-Pulitzer Prize, Nicole Hannah-Jones, still on fire then. And our strategy was have her come, prime the state for a conversation about reparations, and then later that year, Shavonda Sumter would introduce, along with a bunch of other black elected officials, a piece of legislation that would ultimately create a task force to have a conversation about the role of slavery in New Jersey, its enduring impact, and in part two, how might we create policies and practices and make key investments to respond to part one. And I remember Assemblywoman Sumter was like, oh yeah, that's a task force. I remember being shocked <laughs> at how easily thought, she thought we could get it done and how fierce the resistance was and has been. And to watch other states begin to move exactly. with the idea, introduce the bill, do the study, do the, do the meetings and then create studies and see other places, localities do it, has been really inspiring to see it happen out there, but it raises the question, to Ari's point, but why not New Jersey? And if I get really honest, one of the roles of advocates is that we are not captured by political machinery. So we should be able to tell the truth, even when it makes us uncomfortable and those we're telling the truth to uncomfortable. So here is a truth about New Jersey. The reason the bill hasn't moved is because New Jersey is fiercely segregated That's by right. race at the top. We're led by a white male governor. The assembly is led by a white male, Craig Coughlin. 
and the Senate is controlled by another white male, um, Nicholas Scutari. And they have zero appetite, not just for moving a task force, but to even saying the word. I got to tell the story because it's important. To Shivana's point, to the assemblyman's point, we're meeting with Craig Coughlin, the leader of the speaker, the, the speaker, the lead speaker. And some version of what she said happened in one of our meetings. We said, we just want to create a task force. We want to call it the New Jersey Reparations Task Force. And you all, he had like a visceral reaction. It was almost as if somebody touched him violently. And he said, oh my gosh, Ryan, the word reparations, it just, it, <laughs> it unsettles people, right? Like, I, if, you, if you call it anything, and I mean anything, a, a disparity task force, a health task force, shoot, a Black Lives Matter task force, I'd support it. But that word reparations, and you all, the disconnect, right, between experiencing how uncomfortable it was in that moment to be black, and to listening to him talk about his aversion to imagining what it might feel like to feel uncomfortable, was was heartbreaking and for me what it's the signals and I, i'm going to pivot to my last point but well, i don't know if i answered Ari's question is it really became one around allyship that's we throw this word around a lot and the reality is there are 1.4 million black people in new jersey and this you all this has been one of our most popular efforts the reparations piece we've had the most interaction funders have been very drawn to it we have this tool that allows you to interact with legislators. This has been the most used. Um, th they, they have interacted most with elected officials most through this, this campaign, say the word, reparations campaign. 1.4, say it, black, 1.4 million black people in New Jersey. This bill has been widely supported almost by every black elected official in the state. And it's not enough. And it won't be enough. Because one of the realities of race is that there are limitations on what black people alone can do. This bill will move, but it will only move when we see materially, concretely, white allyship. Which is why it's so inspiring to see Reverend Anya Samler here, because we created a Faith Allies for Reparations group led by Reverend Anya Samler and others other white allies, faith leaders, and a, a very diverse group of faith allies who've been going into those spaces and having those hard conversations. So I love, as I close the mayor's point about so much of our, so much of, we talk about the racial disparities, the challenges confronting black folks, and then we look to black people alone. What's the answer? And we know plenty, we know, we have imaginations, unconstrained by the way that race constrains people. But what we often don't have is access to broader allyship to make the things we advocate for real. And a reparations commission task force created legislatively in New Jersey moves when we see in the state broader white allyship that's in those spaces when Governor Murphy goes to where he goes, in his circle, right? When those leaders of the assembly and the legislature, until they diversify, until we have a black governor, for example, until we have black leaders of our legislative chambers, we need white allyship to have those conversations that folks have been largely unwilling to have. Thanks, Ryan. I mean, I, I just want to, I want to plus one everything that you said. I mean, something that we are dogged about at Liberation Ventures is using the word. I mean, people ask me all the time, like, do you have to use the word, just as, as y'all have been saying. And I, and I want to I wanna just highlight, I mean, it's so important. We're here co-sponsoring this event with ICTJ because there, it is so important to remember the international precedent for this work. And that's what I always respond to. I, like when people ask me that, it's, it's indicative of the anti-blackness in our culture that for some reason, so many other communities across the globe can be deserving. And, and to me, that's the answer to why we need to use the word, because if we were to give it away, we would be denying black people the dignity of, belief, of, of knowing that we deserve that, that repair. So I just can wanted I, to- Can I just credit that point? So just really, really quickly, yeah. I know I had a long diatribe, but I love this issue, right? So one important contextual piece is, so I've been at the Institute for Social Justice for eight years, and the first five years of my term, we spent um, just digging into the history of New Jersey, understanding the racial disparities. There was a point in time 
in our, my fifth year there, we created this staircase image. It's a small black boy looking up at these stairs, and you all, on each of those stair, stair step, each of those stairs is a racial disparity confronting black people, and we're the worst on every stair. And for me, someone who came to New Jersey not appreciating that slavery happened here, it was striking. And what led us to the reparations piece is because we looked at these racial disparities and the harm attendant from them. And then we asked ourselves the question, we do great public policy through a racial justice lens. It's great supporting. But to really address those racial disparities, good public policy is insufficient. What you really need is a conversation around reparations. One thing I just want you all to join us in resisting is the idea that we need more data. We need another study. You, Ryan, your team, you, we just, if we had one more thing to consider, yes. Yes. then task force for show. Yeah. That's the head fake, right? That's the head fake and the foul and the free throw for the other team. Because it's not a question of what we know. We now know all we need. It's a question of willingness. And this is why I want to get to the power piece. Because it's not only an issue about learning. We've learned in New Jersey all we need to know to justify not, and very often when we lift up these numbers, then we say, well, Ryan, what do you want to do in response to those numbers? Well, Mayor Barack, what we really want is a task force to study further. We actually could move to reparations today, mm -hmm. right? Yes. But because we understand that folks aren't there, we're, we want to do a study. And even the study is res resistant. So I just want to resist in the spirit of resistance the invitation for more data, so, so Ryan, for more learning. Tell us then about the council. What's yeah. the council working on? Yeah. And then and then I'm gonna say, I'm gonna come back to y'all and I wanna ask you, what, what has been the impact of the council on the conversations that you're having in the rooms that you're in? Yeah, so this is really quick. So one, New Jersey will absolutely pass a New Jersey Reparations Council Commission Task Force. It will be legislatively created I, I can promise you that. I just don't know when. In the meantime, we joined us, I, so many of you on the room, we took our legislation, uh, which was organized around subcommittees, nine or so subcommittees of legislation was, we created nine subcommittees that touch sort of core aspects of life, and black life in particular. And we created the New Jersey Reparations Council on our own, on the theory that while New Jersey goes to the wizard to get some heart to do this thing legislatively, we would get a head start. And when they create it, we could inform what they ultimately do. So this council is led by uh, Tazania Henderson, who's a dean of the graduate school at Rutgers. She might have been here. Um, Khalil Gibran Muhammad are the co-directors of this council. And then it's led for us by Jean-Pierre Brutus, my, my colleague, who has the rare distinction of the JD and the PhD. And he works with them to oversee what are about 45 members on nine committees in a, an array of areas from economic justice to faith and black resistance to health to um, the criminal legal system reform. I mean, it's really, I mean, it's really, there's nothing else like it. In part because we imagined what we would do if we could get the very best minds here in New Jersey and across the state to have this conversation finally around the role of slavery, its enduring impact. And the second piece is, and what do we do in response? And so these nine committees, last piece I'll say, each hold public hearings as a way to invite public testimony, public feedback, because we want that to inform what ultimately will be the writing. And we're thinking about the writing as sort of a, a Nicole Hannah-Jones 1619 piece for New Jersey, that we tell the story of New Jersey and the history of slavery is part one. And each of those chapters organized by those committees will have recommendations, policy and other recommendations, including around key investments to be made to finally repair the enduring harm. And it's our hope that it'll be a vision for a new New Jersey, right? It will be a blueprint for how we can finally address the issue of reparations in this state. I love that, and I just want to put a pin in it, because what I'm hearing you say is that that council's job is not to just do more research. It's actually about the storytelling. It is. It so is. I, want to, I want to hold that, but first I want to ask, what has been the impact? Is that is that helping move things inside? I, I would say so. I mean, uh, five years ago, we wouldn't be having this discussion at all. So 
just the work that's been going on with the Institute of Social Justice and everybody else that's been involved in it, allows us the opportunity to have a discussion, at least on its face, uh, about these issues. E even if it's whether we want to call it uh, a reparations task force or something else. But I think even that discussion helped us push further the, the disparity study. Mm -hmm. That the disparity study may not have moved as quickly as it did if it wasn't for the talk of, the, of reparations. Uh, really, it's like people saying, oh, they want reparations. Let's do this disparity study real quick. And, and the reality is after the disparity study was done, you can see how horrible that is. So we know, uh, you know, not just anecdotally, mm -hmm. we know based on data, as Ryan pointed out, the, the huge kind of gaps that exist uh, in economic growth and development in the, city, in, the, in the state deliberately. And, and that's what, we, what, we, what people are missing the point, is that this stuff is deliberately, it's not happenstance, right, that these things have happened. And so, and, and, and we talk about harm reduction, there's nobody talking about making people whole. Mm -hmm. Reparation just means to repair something. Yeah. When we all agree there's something broken, they all talk about it. I mean, I listen to the budget, everybody talk about every, how everything is broken. But nobody's saying this is how we're going to repair it. We take a shot over the bow and hope uh, that people benefit from, from whatever happens as a result of that because we're afraid to, hit, uh, to do a direct, direct shot at it. Mm -hmm. So if I can add a, a little um, psychology to this. You know, when, when you talk about who's in leadership um, and there's a feeling of, well, I didn't do it me proper and you all seem to be doing better now mm -hmm. any of those statements yeah, that's real 100 sound yeah. familiar 100 racial progress narrative <laughs> <laughs> and what i'm saying is i'm not looking for you to apologize for the sins of our forefathers or to give me a a girl for the progress and resiliency we made in spite of. Right. But literally to document the repair. So to what has just been said, a lot of the progress we're making are connectors. And I can't emphasize that enough. The disparity study is a five year window. Governor Murphy was not there for the full of all of the harm and contract procurement. But check this piece, and I told his team to go back with it. Myself and Senator Rice created the office of a DEI <laughs> officer within Treasury and the position within the governor's office so that they would be able to see through a lens of how we're contracting at the over 700 different departments, divisions, authorities within the state government. In 2019, we did a set-aside program, not only for uh, women minority business owners, but also for veterans and service individuals. They hit a higher mark than black people. Out-of-state contractors did better than black people, and it showed that the talent for, con for construction, <laughs> professional services, and goods were available in the local region because we also heard that there's no talent right. within the community that we can tap <laughs> into or have capacity to do the work or have a special $100 certification that no one tells you you're supposed to have to be designated as a minority women business entity or have any information on where the black businesses are. Mm -hmm. Any of those tales sound familiar. Mm -hmm. We took the layers, peeled the onion off of all those pieces. So we land here today. And those are part of the reparative and, and wealth pieces, let alone being segregated by state for schools, which we're also in court for that now. Right. Because of your zip codes where you could live affordable housing. We're trying to repair that again with the latest iteration of an affordable housing uh, obligatory procedure that we've come up with. And I have to use these specific words. Notice I've taken time to use specific words. I didn't say COA because we're abolishing COA. That's a bad word. We no longer use that word. But it's 200,000 units 
where the floor debate would have taken you back to an era of bigotry and hatred if you go back and look at that hearing. Now, I've been taught that you don't repeat what was said when it's that ugly because I don't want to circulate that type of ugliness. I want to move <coughs> forward. I want to look at restorative actions because when you lift black people, you lift an entire community. And that's the job that I'm working towards, and that's my North Star. Thank you. So I'm going to ask one more question, and then hopefully we have a little bit of time for audience questions. Um, but I want to go back to this storytelling point, because that's why we're all here. We are here to talk about what are the new narratives, what are the new stories that we want to be telling to the cities, the state, and to the country about what reparations are and who they're for. So when y'all are out in the world, what narratives are resonating? When you, when you talk about reparations, what's working for when you're speaking to people, and, and could be anyone, could be the, the base, the choir, or the persuadables. How, what's, what's working for you? What works for me is the fact that California has done it and elected officials didn't lose their office. <laughs> that's the narrative. The world didn't fall apart. <laughs> right? That's the narrative that I have to use. North Carolina did a portion of it for specific towns, and those council people are still in office. New York's governor did it, and guess what? She's still standing. So the world is not ending because we take on the tough issues. And, and I would argue, and I do it all the time, I have to vote on some things where I have to hold my nose often. Mm -hmm. So if this is that for you, I'm asking you to do it in turn for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. That's good. My, my, my circle is a little different. <laughs> <laughs> I just say, we want our own boots. <laughs> We're tired of walking in your boots. No, the, 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 the reality is, you know, I, I think that more people in New Jersey, like regular working families, are more progressive than we give them credit for. Mm -hmm. I think that more people are acceptance of, acceptive of this than, than people would even think. Mm -hmm. I think what we do is we allow pundits and other individuals and cynics and folks that are in charge of these little holes of power to continue this conversation, this narrative that we have, which is why that narrative is down in the state house, that nobody wants to do this, that people believe that this, this isn't right for, for us to do. We don't want to say reparations because reparations means that I did something. Mm -hmm. And it means that I'm admitting that I did something wrong. I think people are way past that, right? Yeah. Past this idea. Everybody is knowledgeable enough to know that none of us were here then, mm -hmm. right? And But the harm has followed us and privilege has followed other people along the way. One, one thing the Dahl test proved uh, that was done when they dismantled uh, segregation supposedly in schools and Brown versus Board of Education and said two things. One, that it did uh, uh, harm to black people, black children specifically in this country, but it also says it did harm to white people in this country. That part is never talked about, mm -hmm. that the harm that has been done to white Americans mm -hmm. in this as well. And to repair this repairs all of us, right? You want us to stop talking about this and stop whining about it, fix it. Right? Do something about it. Let's move on. You don't want us to talk about identity politics or race anymore. Let's move on. Mm -hmm. Help us to move on. James Baldwin, the problem is, James Baldwin pointed out, as long as you think you're white, I'm going to be forced to think I'm black. Mm -hmm. Right? So <laughs> at, at, at the end of the day, stop being white. Yeah. Right? Uh, and, 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 and I know that's like a hard thing to swallow. Mm -hmm. but that's very real. Like, mm -hmm. you're holding on to whiteness. And whiteness to us represents privilege and pain, right? And so let go of whiteness and, and grab hold of your humanity and you'll figure out how to repair something or repair people that was hurt. And then if you don't want us to be black, then we can figure that out. But you have to <laughs> stop being white. Mm. Now, that, that's, that's very real, right? And uh, those are the kind of discussions that, that we have back and forth uh, with folks that I tell people very frankly, no matter where you are or, or, or who you are, or what you believe, or what you look like, that's really what it is, as, as plain as James yeah. Baldwin put it. It's mm. about confronting shame. Yep. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Mm. You're supposed to do something after that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, so I, I think the threshold question to Arya's point is, you know, one, 
you have to be talking to folks who proceed in good faith. Right, I was joking with one of my colleagues at the Institute that we never read the comments. The comments, and you know what, those are just vicious. The comments are vicious. There's some good, good ones in there, I guess, but they're hard, to, they're hard to find. I see folks read. So I think first, the threshold question is to discern good faith. And then if there's good faith, I think there's a spectrum of, of ways. So, you know, going back to the, the, the George Floyd harm reduction strategy, though, they're talking to, to allies. And there, I think it's a question of just expanding our imagination for what's possible. Right? We want to create. The thing, the thing that inspires us about this space is that we're here to imagine the kind of world we know we can create, which starts with an idea, right? And that's got to be an expansive idea. That's not just a harm reduction idea. And then the second one I just want to say really quickly is around conversations. And I was, gonna, I was going to say this, but the mayor did his thing. So th it made me think of this idea of whiteness. Really quick story. So Ari and I are together, we're from Colorado, different parts of Colorado, but the state is really the same, frankly, <laughs> which is the same, pretty white, white. yeah. <laughs> and I was, I'm on the board of my college. I was there this past weekend, um, and I was in the car driving with a, a colleague on the board, and I was talking about our work, and when I'm asked about our work, to be honest, sometimes, depending on the audience, I may not lead with the reparations work for all the reasons that are obvious to you all. But I talked a bit about it. And she had the, the, a reaction that didn't surprise me, but kind of disappointed me, right? And later in the conversation, on my phone, I have a screensaver of this picture of me and, and President Obama, which I keep because it reminds me of Hopeful Day. Just that that, that, that did happen, by the way. Right. There are a host of reasons why I did. I know Justin, but it, it did happen. The folks said it could never happen, and it happened. So I look at them like, wow, that happened. That's important. And so she saw it. She's same conversation in the, in the car. She saw it and she said, oh, wow, yeah, President Obama. She said, my brother-in-law lives next door to him. And I was like, wow. You know, some of you know where I'm about to go with this. And I said, wow. So, and very casually, like, yeah, my brother-in-law, yeah, you know, next to the first block, yeah. I said, wow, well, what does your brother-in-law do? And she said, she said, he's like, you know, like, like kind of like an investment banker thingy, her words. <laughs> and I said, wow, an investment banker thingy lives next door to the first black president. And I said it like that, thinking she'd be like, yeah, that's kind of, kind of odd. But it didn't take right away. And I said, Chris Rock, really quickly, Chris Rock has this famous line in stand-up. <laughs> Where he talks about living in Alpine, New some of you all know he talks about living in Alpine, New Jersey. Right. And he's like, I live in Alpine, New Jersey. You know, everybody knows Chris Rock. And he, he said, I think Mary J. Blige lives there and Michael Strahan, maybe Jay Z and Beyonce live there. And he says in this stand famous stand up, he said, and Guess who lives next door to me? White guy. A dentist. <laughs> And he makes the point that part of what race does is it requires the very, very best of blackness, blackness, to live next door to mediocre white people. And when I shared the Chris Rock one, she was like, oh, wow. It's like I just put on the first pair of contact lenses. Like, I can see it now. And I said, that's why, like, that's why the reparations piece is so important for us. One, because it connects you to this reality that exists that you don't even know about because it's just so natural for you to be in the skin where it makes sense for your brother-in-law, investment banker, <laughs> thingy guy, to live next door to the first black president and you don't even know. And I will say to you, like those kind of one-to-one -one conversations, as painful as they are to have over and over again, actually end up getting a lot of traction and have a shelf life beyond right. just that car ride. That was a great story. Yeah. All right. I think we have some time for audience questions. Yeah, absolutely. Can we run a mic? Yeah. So we're going to do questions, and then we're going to show a short video from Amiri Baraka. I live here in New Jersey. I happened to be there in the governor's uh, in, in the uh, assembly yesterday when the governor was talking about how diverse a state we are, and you know, he said it with great pride. Yeah. 
Um, he neglected to talk about uh, the fact that New Jersey is the sixth most segregated city, no, state, state in the country, right? And so you all are talking about housing desegregation um, as a means of curtailing some of that. And I think that's probably not going to happen. Um, you know, we're not going to go in with, you know, jackboots and make people move, right? Uh, but we can do something about the fact that there are 530 some odd school districts in this state. More, more than that. And um, in addition to the fact that it's Probably a huge hours. waste of resources, mm -hmm. uh, it seems to me that that is one area where we could facilitate a proximity among white students and all the other students who live here in New Jersey, and there is a lot. I mean, we have, we are a diverse state, there's no doubt about it, but we live in segregated homes, and white kids don't have an opportunity to meet their counterparts and peers in black, black and brown communities. And I think that if we could do that, if we could create more proximity, we could create more collaborators. We need collaborators, not necessarily allies. Mm -hmm. And so I'm hoping that whatever this reparations task force comes up with, mm -hmm. it includes desegregating our schools and reapportioning all of the resources. I mean, mm -hmm. 530 some odd 600. superintendents 600. that make 600. over 200. There are actually more superintendents than mayors <laughs> uh, uh, in the state of Georgia. Absolutely. Hmm. Other questions? So what are the reparations that work? What can we all work on? We don't really need to wait for legislation. We all do work, so what advice can you give us on what can we do that works? So uh, I'm gonna go to a couple of things, um, and the mayor has been privy to it. On the, on the state level, some of the things we work on, the health disparities piece, making sure there's funding for uh, six cell programs for maternal health, um, putting funding with it, because it's not enough to just state that it's an issue. Um, you heard about graduate medical education credits and units. You heard uh, yesterday, those of you who are at the budget address about nursing programs because we have a nursing shortage, so loan forgiveness. Those things matter because when we go to school, sometimes it's start and stop for black folks uh, because of economics and resources, being sure that the Education Opportunity Fund is funded. The other piece I would add uh, is guaranteed income programs. Those made the difference. Patterson has a pilot program. I'm going to uplift it as education, um, as a statewide program uh, for those because for those who need it because it makes a difference. Uh, we also did the uh, food insecurities pieces. When we expanded SNAP, people didn't have to spend money on food when we knew the cost was going up, and that was a universal piece. And granted, I would argue black folks always been hungry, right? But when, when it became a bigger problem, the speaker took it up as an issue and always hunger has been his issue. But child hunger was an extreme issue in the state of New Jersey. We did breakfast before the bell, lunch, and being able to take snacks home. But when schools were closed in the pandemic, families weren't eating. And this became glaringly clear. And it took a pandemic for us to respond. Those are some of the things that can still exist post the pandemic to help ends meet as just some of the programs uh, that we all can continue to work on. I, in my agency, my day job uh, for Children's Aid and Family Services, we support diapers for families in need because government does not pay for diapers. So again, they're expensive, $10 a pack. So when you think about how we can support families, health, wellness of our community, those are areas where we can double down in that space. I would go um, a step further. I agree okay. with everything you said, everyone has said, because everything we fight for, everybody benefits from. And that's, that's what we need. When Robert Smalls 
uh, escaped slavery and came back and fought in the Union Army and freed his own family and became two-term serving legislator, South Carolina legislator. When they fought in radical reconstruction for the 14th Amendment, they didn't know 400 years later it would be the uh, amendment that everybody uses for due process. Or that immigrants 400 years later will be using the same amendment that former slaves used to establish their citizenship in this country. So everybody is going to benefit from the thing because the rising tide lifts all boats. It's going to benefit from whatever we fight for. But ultimately, what we've been afraid to do is target black people. Uh, black people are targeted in the street. Uh, you know, they're targeted in front of rec centers and shot down. Targeted and choked to death for cigarettes. Char targeted for suspicious wallets, for playing their music too loud. We're targeted in ShopRite and Louis Vuitton stores, right? But nobody wants to target us in the legislature for, for doing good, right? So tar target our community specifically. And it be, it's, be, it be, it's this problem, right? So while we're fighting for, uh, against affirmative action now in these universities that I think is going to spread everywhere else, uh, you know, if we don't do anything about it. I think we should target black people in these communities who cannot afford to go to college and give them money. We should target families, women, who are having a difficult time affording doctors and doulas and give them money. Target black people who are suffering in these communities because of decades, centuries of systemic racism, right? Uh, who cannot benefit from everything else. So when we say, oh, we're going to do something around housing, that's great. All Americans are going to benefit from that. And we should do that. Because we've never required anybody else's subjugation as the cost of our freedom. Right, so at the end of the day, everybody should benefit from it. But please, help my mama. Right, and, and that's really what, what I think th these groups should be doing. Target the individuals who are being harmed the most. I'm excited to see that for when you become governor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I actually I want to jump in on this question too because I think it, it raises something really interesting, which is how do we define what work, what work means, right? What does the other side of preparations feel like, look like, taste like, smell like for black people and for all of us? And you know, we, we have defined the aspirations for what we want reparations to achieve so often in financial terms, right? And that's important. We need to close the wealth gap. But also, well, what, what, how about closing the life expectancy gap? Right. right? How about thinking about what people, how about making sure every single person in this country knows what the Civil War was about? So I think those are the conversations that I'm also excited about having not only at the national level, but in, at the local level. And I think that's what's so, so promising about the council, is that the story you're telling is, a, is about a unique, a place-based experience of harm that then has a place-based reparative uh, process that needs to happen. Yeah, I, I just want to weigh in on that, because I do think there's an importance of understanding what shapes our identity accurately. So one of my biggest learnings coming from our beloved Colorado to New Jersey was that slavery happened here. I remember talking to folks about that at native New Jerseyans, not you all, far less sophisticated people, Aaron, than you all. And they, like Speaker Craig Coughlin, would get upset. Stop, you know, as young folks say, stop the cat. Like, that didn't happen here. <laughs> We've always been a beacon for democracy, freedom, liberty. And in fact, though people don't appreciate the way slavery happened here or that it happened at all, we are profoundly shaped by it. Every aspect of New Jersey, so part of in my mind, reparations is an understanding of who we are. If ever we're to solve the challenges that we face, we first have to understand what those challenges are, are rooted in. And so to the question of like what works around reparations, I'll say this, like think about this. This, to the mayor's point, five years ago, 2019, there was a raging national conversation about whether black lives matter. You remember this, right? And if black lives matter, right? folks were like, man, that was five years ago, yes. And if black lives matter, could other lives matter too? Right. Like, could black lives and blue lives matter? Like, what about if you're not black or blue? Could some other, like, how did it work? It was like a zero sum game. It was very sophisticated. But at the end of the fight, right, at the end of the fight, what we were fighting 
prayed for was like baseline, like just mattering. That's right. Right? At the end of the day, all that was about like, just can we disagree? But the undeniable truth is that black people matter, right? It's not even a come up. Even then we were just like, because if we matter, maybe then we could come up with some, some, some terms of engagement. Right. Like maybe you won't, like maybe you won't choke me out in front of the world, right? Maybe, maybe you treat me with decency if I, if I matter. Not a lot, just matter. That's important to remember, that was just five years ago. And then you saw this crazy, expeditious move to like, yes, Black Lives Matter so much, we're going to proclaim it on streets, yes. signs. Yes. People even brought back bumper stickers. Yes. Remember those things? <laughs> Tiffany, bumper stickers. And the world moved from like questioning it to like, we're not going to question it. Even if we don't believe it, we're going to say it on t-shirts yep. and all that. That was like 19, 20, 21, kind of through the pandemic. And you, 22-ish, right? It's cooled off a little bit. But now there's this conversation about reparations. And across the country, states, cities are taking legislative action or forming commissions in their towns, having these conversations. I just don't want people to sleep on the importance of it. Last thing I'll say, when I started as a lawyer, this would be 2001, there was a, in Ketchy, there was a solo practitioner who was bringing these cases against companies that insured against the loss of ships carrying enslaved people and enslaved people. I wish I could remember her, her name. Yes. Say it, please say it. Farmer. Yes. Solo practitioner on her own bringing these cases. And I happened to be at a law firm that had a company represented called Lloyds of London. Why would they be being sued, one wonders? She brought this lawsuit. And I remember that the defense that was offered that ultimately defeated her case was the defense of latches. This is a Latin term, which means essentially Right. If you sleep on your claim, you don't get a benefit from it. Other words, in other words, you waited too long right. to bring this case. And she was like, when else in history would I have brought the case, right? But what I love is that the doctrine of latches hasn't stopped this conversation here, right? We're not bound by those ridiculous defenses in the law or even no disrespect to our less courageous legislators by what a governor or assembly leader or, uh, or um, senate president will do. We, we control the power to drive a narrative to advance this conversation. And that for me, I don't want folks to miss the significance of that in 2024, given where we started five years ago, where she started in 2001. And this has been a live conversation uh, even before any of us were alive. Thank you so much. I think, I think we, we have to close. I know we have more questions. I know. Oh, Kiki. OK, let's go. All right. Got to. Got to. Got to. Got to. Project the Kiki. You got to. Bill Craig, I only need to say this is a my race issue of, of lashes. You won't see all these names on these table. I mean, I wasn't involved with any of those names on, on, on the table. But strategically, the reason why we talked about Belinda Sutton Royal, the reason why we talked about Callie House, the reason why we talked about Queen Mother, uh, Mother Moore, Moore and the like was because we tried to show that there was never a time when we slept on our claims. There was always the people right, right. who talked about the issue of reparations way back from the uh, uh, you know, slavery time all the way until uh, down to the day of week. It was strategic, specifically, to defeat legal claims such as that. Legal claims, the reason why we talk about the living legacies of the enslavement era, the, uh, uh, the criminal punishment system, the health disparities, the educational um, inequities and the like, was to defeat the legal claim of statute of limitations. Right. That is too long, slavery was too long ago. And you can't, like Toby said, no, it's still lingering, it's still lasting today. Mm. So all the things that we talk about today, there were strategic reasons why we see all of this pumping up mm. now because we were trying to um, defeat some I happen to be sitting next to a young man from UCLA, California, who 
started the hashtag Black Lives Matter. Oh. Mm. He is the person. I love this. No, I mean this is what this is why we're here, right? Is to be giving each other flowers, yeah. to be making each other up, to be teaching each other, to be making sure that we all understand the batons that are being passed to us and where those batons have been. So, so thank you so much for jumping in. I'm gonna I'm gonna close us out. I want to say one sentence from each of you. The other side of reparations feels like freedom, justice, liberation. Thank you. Can we do a round of applause?